it is my pleasure to warmly welcome all of our listeners today um, to today's DASICON breakout session number five, um, called The Resilience of Food Supply Chains in Times of Crisis. Now, as we all know, um, the effects of COVID-19 are still to be felt all over the world, and they affect supply chains in all types of industries, among them food supply chains which are more complex and global than ever, and therefore more endangered by shocks and catastrophes than they have ever been before. Now, shocks to global food supply chains also jeopardize the quality and accessibility of food. This leads us to certain questions. How can supply chains deal with these shocks? And what role, if any, do governments in preparing uh, do governments play in preparing supply chains for such shocks? Um, to discuss this topic, we invited two specialists today: Professor Dr. Christian Fika and Ms. Bettina Rosenberger. But before we begin our discussion, I would like to lose a few words on organizational matters. Um, we will start today's panel by introducing both speakers in a bit more detail in a minute. And afterwards, both of them will be given space for their opening remarks. After that, the floor will be opened for questions. For the moment, all listeners are muted to assure the flow of the conversation. Um, but you are at any time welcome to send questions to us via the chat function, and I will later read them out for you. If it is important to you to ask your question in person, please make this known and the floor will be given to you. Um, to now commence with our topic, I would like to take a minute to introduce our speakers in a bit more detail. As I've mentioned, we have with us today, Professor Dr. Christian Fieke, who is um, full professor and chair of food supply and management at the University of Bayreuth. Professor Fieke received a master's degree in supply chain management from the Vienna University of Business and Economics. And he received his doctorate and his habilitation at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. Later, he worked as a lecturer and researcher in Spain, Finland, and Austria before joining the University of Bayreuth. There, Professor Fieke researches business management issues in food supply chains and computer-based decision-making processes. Ms. Bettina Rosenberger is the general manager of the NGO Netzwerk Soziale Verantwortung, which translates to Network Social Responsibility in English, and she advocates for higher standards in corporate social responsibility, especially in connection with human rights issues. Ms. Rosenberger is the coordinator of the campaign Human Rights Need Legislation, and she studied development and political science in Vienna. She focuses on social movements, human rights, and union work. Now, to start off this very fascinating topics, topic with some opening remarks, Professor Fika, I would like to start with a question to you. And my question is, how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect food supply chains worldwide? And what can be done to prepare these supply chains for future shocks? Okay, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, let me start with a short, honest remark. It's a little bit strange because the title is in times of crisis and it feels like it's not COVID we should discuss today, but maybe other points which also gonna have impact on food supply. But I myself am a business professor, I'm not an economist. So I actually cannot tell you too much about this geopolitical, agricultural trade businesses, but I can tell you a lot about the operational issue we find in food supply chains. And we saw a lot also during uh, COVID. COVID actually, if you think about the food supply chains, COVID showed us nothing too much new. It just showed us the problem maybe to a bigger point, the issues we are facing. First of all, maybe some of you remember, uh, we had a lack of pasta in supermarkets, lack of rice, lack of yeast. People were storming the supermarket. People were stockpiling. People were afraid that they don't get enough food. 
And this leads to a lot of issues. We saw similar things already before doing earthquakes, natural hazard events, Japan, Fukushima, Dohoku is a good example for that. So this was nothing really new. That's just the scale was new. But the question is now what we can do. So that was the bigger question. First of all, we have to understand that food is not food. So basically shipping meat is completely different than shipping dairy products. Uh, seafood is different to um, temperature controlled items and so on. So there's a lot of varieties, but in all of this industry, we have some kind of bottlenecks. Often this is transportation, often these are disposal facilities, often these are certain public authorities which have to do some certain check. So that's also the first thing we can do from the side. Just think about it. Often we don't really know our supply chain. We don't really understand how it works. We don't understand where our partners are. So our first thing, if the question is what we can do, is just simply look at, take a look at it, think. What are we dealing with? The second step, we have a tendency to have a zero waste policy more and more, try to reduce inventory. This makes a lot of sense, but not from a resilience perspective. For a resilience perspective, we need inventory just in case something goes wrong. Let me maybe just briefly define resilience because often there are different terms here. With resilience, we often mean that we, if something happens, we try to get it back as fast as possible to the normal state. Compared to robustness, what it means from the start, we don't try that something can go wrong. And so we can see this trend to reduce inventory. This makes a lot of sense. This reduces costs, but this can lead to a lot of problems. Maybe one of my favorite stories I heard once, I don't know if it's, it's true, but I believe it at least from as myself as an Austrian. So in all of the countries, you have some recommendation from the government how much food you should store at home. And someone at least told me once that in Austria, we only, the average household only reaches this recommendation when it comes to wine. For all other items, you do not store enough at home as the government would expect you for, to prepare for crisis. So we can obviously stock up. That's the next thing. And the third thing, and that actually worked quite well during COVID, and I can discuss this later also in the answers quite well, is just to be flexible. So for example, during COVID, we were quite uh, flexible with uh, driving bans, the driving regulation, allow additional transport of food so that we are more flexible we can. We had military support, not just in Austria, Austria is one example, but all over the world, where they took over logistics, they helped. So there's a lot of things we can do. There's a lot of things we can, think that we can do better. The biggest challenge we'll face are more like just also what we saw during COVID and just to end my statement with this, is just that we have currently a severe shortage of of staff in a lot of industry relevant for our food supply, specifically harvest helper and truck drivers. Brexit, we saw this all, we saw all this news about empty shelves, empty, no gasoline and so on. This is not a UK issue. This is an issue in a lot of places in the world that we do not have enough staff anymore. You can discuss this for, for weeks, why? Not, not an attractive job, not good payment and so on. A lot of social issues as well. But that's basically what we have to take attention to. Because if you want to be resilient, if you want to have food, and again, like the definition of food security is not just that we have enough food, it's also that we have food at the right quality and the right price. And to just guarantee that, we simply have to prepare better. We have to be more active. We have to generate systems that are flexible, which can work well. And then we can just hope that it works out the next time. But we have to say that actually COVID when it came to food supply chains, it worked actually out quite decently. Not perfectly, but it could have been way worse. Thank you very much, Professor Fieke. As we can see, there are a lot of areas that can be tackled, um, which also give space to many different solutions and I'm sure will lead to very interesting ideas in the future. Um, Ms. Rosenberger, I would now like to give the floor to you and also start the conversation with an opening question. And my question is, um, on Wednesday, the European Commission presented its proposed supply chain law, which aims to foster sustainable and responsible corporate behavior throughout global supply chains. How would this step affect food supply chain resilience in the future? Thanks for having me. First of all, I would like to start with a more general statement um, because um, our food system is broken. It is destroying rainforests and exploiting workers. 
And especially if we are talking about the COVID crisis, it became more and more clear and that uh, workers are really at a high risk of getting uh, exploited, but also of getting uh, ill. And so uh, we need uh, more measures uh, to protect them. And as civil society organizations and unions, we welcome this uh, proposal, which was presented by the European uh, Commission on Wednesday, because if we really want to end uh, child labor and uh, labor exploitation along the uh, global supply chains, we uh, have uh, to end uh, this exploitation uh, uh, within uh, to implement uh, binding rules for uh, corporations. After a uh, free proposal, uh, months, the European Commission uh, presents uh, this uh, proposal on Wednesday, uh, which is a very important step in the right uh, direction. The EU Commission has set an important milestone to protect human rights and the environment along global supply chains, but to ensure that human rights abusers, exploitive child labor, and the destruction of our environment are no longer a business as usual, we have to ensure that this um, law um, doesn't contain uh, any uh, loopholes. The EU supply chain law will uh, apply to uh, companies with 500 or more uh, employees and a turnover of uh, 150 million euros. Uh, companies that uh, meet uh, this criteria will have to implement human rights and environmental uh, due diligence uh, requirements. And this involves uh, risk analyzers, uh, which is an important tool for preventing uh, human rights violations and environmental damage. This is the only instrument uh, to ensure that human rights abusers and environment damages uh, don't occur anymore. The directives uh, cover the entire supply chains and um, all sectors. In the high risk areas, uh, such as the agriculture sector, for example, the Supply Chain Act uh, will also apply to uh, corporations with uh, 250 and uh, more employees and a turnover of uh, 40 million euros. SMEs uh, will not be affected um, by the law, and so for that reason, uh, the EU Supply Chain Act uh, will, uh, or, um, would only apply to, uh, to less than uh, 0.2 uh, corporations in the European Union. And uh, that is also one of our main critic points. Because uh, even if corporations don't meet in this criteria, they can be involved in human rights or environmental damages. And so in the long term, there is a need for measures that affect uh, more corporations, but uh, we appreciate that the proposal include uh, civil liability because uh, civil liability is the uh, only way how uh, we can ensure that people who suffered harm have the uh, possibility uh, to get a remedy. Because, and also are able uh, to uh, file a lawsuit um, before a new court, uh, because financial penalties alone are not uh, reaching uh, to victims. And the fine go to the states and not constitutes a uh, remedy for those affected. Such uh, liabilities currently in the missing in the uh, German Supply Chain Act, which was uh, adopted last summer, and now it's up to the European Parliament and also to the European uh, governments um, to fix uh, this uh, legislation and uh, to ensure that the people who are producing our food are protected uh, from Corona as well as from exploitation. And uh, that's also why um, this future law must be a victim based. Uh, if the law doesn't make it easier for victims to hold a business accountable, then it's unlikely to make a significant uh, difference. Uh, so in conclusion, if we want resilient supply chains, or I would rather call it uh, sustainable supply chains, uh, we have to protect um, the planet and uh, also the people who are producing our food. Thank you very much, Mrs. Rosenberger, for this insight into into the eu law on on supply chains 
Um, I'm sure the last word on the issue is not yet spoken, and it will be very interesting to see how the law will turn out in the end. I now thank uh, Professor Fika and Ms. Rosenberger very much for your opening remarks, and we would now move on to the questions posed by the audience. And as I can see, we already have a request for a question, so I might now ask our technical team to please unmute Mr. Aaron Shilhan and Aaron to turn on your camera. Yes, as you already have, and please ask your question and indicate whom you would like to, to direct it to. The floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. First of all, <clears throat> thank you to both the speakers for this very interesting panel. Um, my question uh, revolves around um, the process of securitization, so political dialogue. And uh, it would be directed at Professor Ficar. Um, and it, my question basically is, does food security in times of crises um, join the political dialogue of national security in order to politicize it, in order to um, make it more present in, in, in the minds of, of the general of the government and also of the peoples of <clears throat> affected countries? Thank you very much. Um, it's not really a question I can answer because it's not my expertise in policy. I just give you, can give you one example and a project I was involved in where we focused. It was actually quite an interesting story because we met like a couple of months before COVID really became COVID, let's say this way. So like late 2019 um, with multiple experts, uh, policy experts from National Security Councils. And they talked about the African swine fever, one of the biggest threat to national security. So African swine fever is a disease which is uh, basically deadly in 100% case or fatal in 100% cases for domestic pigs. And which is spreading really slowly currently from Eastern Europe into Germany. I don't think there's a case in Austria yet, but the first case in Germany, at least in wild boar population are the domestic pigs. And Basically, if you have a case there, you have to kill all your animals in a, in a certain area which were in contact with that. So it's quite drastic. And there were big fears that this has a huge issue, obviously, on the economic stability situation um, in Western Europe, if this really now comes at a bigger scale. So the, the discussion is there, the awareness is there. Um, Personally, again, I'm no policy expert, so I cannot talk you, tell you too much about like national government or European level. There you would have to ask one of my colleagues at the university who is a food law expert. What I can tell you is that a lot of food decisions are often also taken at a way lower level, more like at a regional or even district level. Because when you think about food, especially in our food supply chain resilience, we often have like really important um, demand points like hospitality sector, schools, kindergartens, hospitals, universities. And there's often a lot of conversation actually between supply chains, regional supply chains and the governments to see on the one hand, how can you support the local economy? How can you support biodiversity on these points? And this obviously, to get back to the topic of now resilience, also have advantages of resilience. Because if we have a shorter supply chain, if we have less transport, if we have more contact, if we have more communication, we have a defini by definition are already more resilient because less can go wrong. It's quite easy. I mean, we are a really international group here. It's obviously if we are all together in the same room and don't have an online teaching, everything would be a lot more easy, for example. So there's a lot of communication on a national level. That's just not my expertise, but I can give you this one example where this is happening. There are, there are these talks and there are these ideas to find bottlenecks, but how it then goes to policy regulations, laws, this is just not my expertise. I'm a business professor, as I said before. I'm not focusing on policy or regulations. Ms. Rosenberger, as something of a policy expert, is there anything you would like to add to this question? No, I would also agree with the uh, point of my colleague that I'm also not an expert of this issue, so I'm sorry. Very well. Then thank you very much, Aaron, for your question and Thank you to our speakers for this answer. And I believe we can already move on to the next question, which will be posed by Theodor Ru, who has already turned on his camera. So I would like you to please unmute him and give the floor to Theodor. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the presentations. Uh, my question is related to the recent um, uh, events in Ukraine, and um, I'm not sure about uh, your expertise in, in this uh, on this topic, but I was uh, wondering, was uh, reflecting a bit, how could we ensure the resilience of food supply chains in Europe in case of a, a bigger war? Um, do you have some thoughts on this? Thanks. Um, yeah, as I mentioned right at the start, it's a super tricky topic. Um, obviously, we know there's a lot of grain now in this conflict involved. I think the top the top two grain exporters in the world. Um, what this means now is always, I think, the question of the scale. I mean, the first way to get more resilient in this perspective is to change our consumption patterns. Let's say there's really like a big crisis and we cannot get products from a certain country anymore which are not domestic in your home area, then you need to change your consumption, which is not so difficult in a lot of cases, especially if you get to this level of severeness, as you're talking about. From a more global perspective, the topic is more challenging. So it's really difficult to answer because I think it depends so much on the conflict. I luckily no, have no experience with bigger wars in this setting. We know from this, uh, the Huko earthquake Fukushima in Japan, that there was a lot of issues for the export industry of rice afterwards, because obviously nobody took Japanese rice anymore from the area where this nuclear fallout existed. And this took multiple years until the industry bounced back. I think I have it on my slides, which I normally teach, but it's, I don't know how many years, but it was a couple of years for sure until the first batch was exported again to Singapore. Now more like from a, from a national security perspective, depends again on the country where you are. Some countries have food reserves, for case of emergencies, other not. We all know the United Nations have food reserves for humanitarian crisis in certain places in the world. Um, again, it exists, it depends all again on how big the conflict will be. I think for, for at least the things maybe until a week ago, I could imagine as a Western born man in the 80s, uh, I would say the food supply chains are safe, but, who knows what can come still. Thank you very much to this insightful answer. I think it also shows um, how much uncertainty there is involved with supply chains in general and also food supply chains and how important it is to manage them. Um, as I can see, we already have the next question lined up. Um, which will be asked by Alberta Quay. Um, so Alberta, I would like you please to, to take the floor now and to let us know what you would like to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is to Miss Tina. Um, I want to know how the COVID-19 has changed, if any, um, the agricultural policy of the EU. Yeah, that's a very uh, good uh, question. I think um, the COVID crisis is very much uh, linked to this uh, proposal because uh, two years ago, uh, when this whole process started in April uh, 2020, uh, the EU Commissioner for Justice, uh, Didi Render, announced very suddenly that he is uh, going uh, to present this proposal. So we are waiting for this process now for uh, two years. And uh, also this whole COVID crisis uh, show um, this whole things that we know for years that uh, we are not able to buy uh, chocolate at the supermarket uh, without uh, child labor and that also uh, um, all these cookies which you can buy at the supermarkets contain palm oil and that their workers are exploited on these uh, plantations and so on. But this whole crisis make it uh, so much clearer that uh, the politicians uh, have to act now. And uh, so I think uh, this crisis uh, should, be in, uh, uh, should be linked uh, to this uh, proposal and I also think that uh, this new regulation, which uh, have uh, to be uh, in a more uh, effective way uh, in the future, hopefully, uh, can uh, make real an effort uh, also to uh, tackle this crisis. 
because uh, we see um, that uh, people all over the world in the global supply chains uh, had a really high risk um, to um, and get ill to uh, work or who uh, lost their jobs um, because of this crisis. And uh, so from that point of view, I really think that this uh, proposal could make a difference if uh, we get the opportunity uh, to add uh, some points there. So I hope uh, you uh, answer all the questions or do you have any points? Yes, thank you. You've answered them. <laughs> Thank you very much for this concise answer. Um, I believe since we only have 20 more minutes to go, it would be good to move straight on to the next question. And the next question will be posted by Paulina Hennings. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the presentations. Um, Professor Fikar, um, I, what I found really interesting um, from what you said was the re about zero waste and the relationship um, it has with resilience of food chains because so far everything that I've heard from zero waste is that it's a good thing and that we should waste less and then so I'm wondering if the if more waste in order to have more resilient food chains isn't some kind of vicious circle or something if that makes um, sense. yeah me you have to be a little bit careful here because zero waste doesn't mean zero waste. It's the same like how we in logistics, we call it more trust in time, which is a concept which is kind of related with. And it never means that you have no inventories. It doesn't mean they have no waste. But I, I tried the panel before. I don't know how it was called, but there was this colleagues from the Good to Go who do an amazing job. And he said the statement which kind of stuck with me that his dream would be that he has no job because then there's no food waste. The problem is though that this is not what food is, how food works. Food is perishable. Food is uncertain in quantity and quality. That's how harvest work. Food is not perfect by definition. That's why I love to work with food. That's exactly why I'm so interested in this field. And if there's no food waste, we're all starving, basically. Simply, next time you, you drive your car, with, uh, hopefully with a train or something more environmentally friendly, and you see some agricultural area, just look, around, look outside, you will see there's a lot of food just lying around on the farm. Just simply because that's how harvest works. You cannot collect everything. Not everything is in the right quality. Not everything can be collected. So the zero, the zero waste at the end food is impossible. Simply because I can also not control perfectly how my food decays. Sometimes there is some just some infection happening. Sometimes we might have a blackout and my cooling system fails. So this discussion is a, is a huge one, not just in food. In food is a little bit more special. But even in other, in other industry, we always had this general tendency over the last years to reduce waste as much as possible. There's a Japanese concept called lean management, where you could talk about mudas, I hope I pronounce this correctly, where you try to identify specifically different waste. This doesn't be waste like to dance in a physical waste, it could also be uh, time wasted, would also count as a waste there. And over years, we try to be way more efficient here. Safe costs. You can also just call it safe costs because that's in the end what it is. A food waste is also a cost factor. Not so a social and environmental problem, it's also a cost factor. Um, but that's exactly in conflict with resilience. What is the most, what is, what are you as a household the most resilient in? Let's go back to the colleague from before. Let's say, let's not hope so, but let's really think about the worst thing which could happen now from a war perspective. The safest you would be in a bunker with food for, I don't know, five years, a decade, even longer. But you will have waste then automatically. So there's always a huge conflict. And the problem is that this also, like for me, from a business perspective now, um, is a trade-off which we'd have to take in companies. Um, and this story goes back then to, to go back also to this to good to go, which again is a really nice concept, um, is also from the perspective of a restaurant. I need to decide on the, on the start of the day how much items or how much in general I want to produce. Let's think maybe about like a student dining area, which is a little bit easier to. So the start I have to expect, have forecast how many students will eat here today. And if zero students are coming, I have to throw a lot of food away. Hopefully I can donate it. There's a lot of ways what I can do with the food before I throw it away, obviously. If there's suddenly 500 students coming and I only cook for 100 students, the students will be really upset 
I lose a lot of money and the students won't come in the future anymore. That's what we talk about fill rates uh, service level. It's the definition we use in business. And we know from most supermarkets uh, that we aim for fill rates often in the high 90%, which means that we, we, ex we store way more because it's way more costly to lose a customer than to throw something away. And now, um, as you maybe can hear, I'm Austrian. We as Austrians have a huge issue. That's our daily bread. So the Austrian has to expect that even if we go 10 minutes before the supermarket closes, we still want to go to the supermarket and buy our wonderfully baked fresh bread. And before Christmas, I decided to drive around with a food bank, with a local food bank, which collects food at the end of the day. And even for me as an ex, as a supposedly an expert in this field, I was completely shocked about how much food this is. So yeah, this conflict is super interesting, but there's also no solution. But that doesn't mean that zero waste is, bad, is a bad thing because there's still a lot of things you can improve, but the, the whole idea of no waste at all is impossible because that would mean we are completely... And again, I was honestly, I was super shocked to, to COVID how much inventory there was available in the end because at least in the areas where I was present, yeah, there was maybe only full grain pasta left maybe, and not the, the regular pasta was gone. Yeast, yeast was the only issue we really had, at least if you read to the literature. But all the other things, there was still plenty of food available everywhere, at least in Austin, Germany, where I lived in the time. Yeah, the comment in the, here that you are allowed to collect the, the rest of the harvest. Yeah, that's a really good idea. It happens in a lot of places, exactly. But still, what I also mean is like, food is also getting damaged by definition doing harvest, for example, and they're not suitable for consumption anymore. Thank you very much for this answer. And I think that was a very interesting way to put into perspective what zero waste actually means and how hard or even impossible this idea of no waste at all is to actually achieve in practice um, even though it is a term we seem to hear a lot at the moment. Um, we have one more question in the chat, and I would like to give the floor to Katrin Kienmander um, to give her the chance to ask her question. Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Great. Um, I would like to thank you both for your interesting presentations. And I have a question for Professor Fika. So, hi, Christian, nice to see you again. Um, I was wondering, because you were talking about, of course, how unreliable food is and that it's just perishable in its nature. And so you can't really live in a world without food waste if you want to eat food, basically. And I was wondering, because I was always very opposed to the idea of genetically modified food, but I've also heard a lot from um, scientists that it would kind of be an option to reduce food waste. And I was wondering what your stance on this issue is. Um, nice to see you again. So she was a bachelor student of mine, just to say, to explain the situation now. Um, and also the one who invited me to speak here today who multiple corners or recommended me at least. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, super difficult topic. I know that a lot of my colleagues really focus on that, extending shelf life. Um, personal opinion for me is maybe a little bit difficult because I'm not personally not a fan of genetically modified food. But then the question is, what is genetically modified food? Is not what we did like through years of through history, wasn't this also gen genetically modified, just not controlled genetically modified, so just by breeding certain types of things together. So the topic in general is super, super, super complicated. In the end, um, from a simple food waste perspective, we talk about uh, shelf life in the end, extending shelf life. And there's a lot, actually a lot of easy ways how you can extend shelf life for the products. One of the biggest issues we often do is we store items uh, not in the correct way. So maybe some of you are not are putting your tomatoes in the fridge. That's a really bad idea. Maybe some of you are storing your apples next to your bananas. That's a really bad idea. And I still learn myself 
every day in my work, I learn new things which I'm doing wrong in this respect. Uh, or more like a cultural side, when we more talk about like also developing countries, uh, we often have the issue that we have the lack of cooling equipment, uh, that we store items in direct sunlight, which induce spoilage. If we find, can find here a control genetically modified mechanism we can, which can help to solve these problems. So for example, let's talk about a strawberry. Strawberry normally has a shelf life of seven days at optimal storage condition, which it's rarely met. If I now find any way for my strawberry that it can also maintain its entire shelf life at 30 degrees Celsius, then this obviously would be ideal from a food waste perspective because a longer shelf life automatically means that I have less issues, that I have more flexibility. If I can somehow figure out that my schnitzel, now the Viennese, which I cooked today, freshly deep fried, uh, I can still eat tomorrow at exactly the same quality without many noticing any difference, then this would also be perfect. What the risks are, I cannot answer as an expert because I'm not I'm no expert on genetically modified food. Everyone has to decide for themselves if you want to live in a world like that or not. But from a food perspective, it's one of the biggest solutions and it's discussed a lot in the, in the uh, in this field. And there's certainly a lot, I think the just my personal, because you asked specifically from my personal standpoint as well, my personal standpoint is the answer must lie somewhere in the middle. A little, there's certainly a, a few things which we can do which were really helpful, but we probably really have to be careful on how to take these steps and when to take them and, and how, yeah, as said before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this um, answer to this uh, very, very pressing and, and interesting question, um, Professor Fieker. Since I can see that there are no more questions in the chat at the moment, um, I would like to use this opportunity to pose a question that has interested myself very much concerning this topic. And I would like to ask this to you, Ms. Rosenberger. Um, as we know, modern supply chains, and I'm sure that also goes for food supply chains, are a complex issue um, with lots of parties involved with producers, with logistics providers, warehouses, retailers, and in the end, of course, customers. So at the beginning of this panel, we visited the European supply chain law. And my question concerning that is, um, who in the end is responsible for a supply chain that encompasses multiple act actors is responsible for the functioning of that supply chain? Is it the final retailer? Is it the logistics providers? Is this a role that governments can play? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, thanks for your very interesting uh, question. Of course, supply chains are very sophisticated, and especially if we look back at the last decades, they get even more sophisticated. But uh, at the same time, supply chains aren't something that uh, were, construct, uh, that, uh, were, were constructed uh, by people and not something uh, that developed uh, by nature. And uh, so I think it's um, a multiple um, uh, decision. It's a decision which is made um, by uh, politicians, but also um, by corporations, because uh, corporations, of course, uh, take the decision uh, to uh, build uh, new uh, factories in the global south, who uh, moved from one place uh, to another, uh, and so on. And we see um, these uh, developments in the last decades. But at the same uh, time, we see that all uh, these uh, steps which were taken in the last decades to tackle this problem, like I uh, already mentioned, and uh, the problem with uh, child labor in the cocoa sector, uh, politicians are talking about more than, and also corporations are talking about more than uh, 20 years about this issue, because we are really talking about hazardous uh, conditions about children who are at the age of seven, 
who really should go to school instead of working and uh, they don't just help the parents they uh, really uh, have to work uh, with pesticides uh, and so on which uh, really endanger um, their health and also their life and yeah and there we see and that these voluntary uh, standards which uh, were set up in the last decades and uh, doesn't work and uh, that's the reason why we need uh, binding uh, rules but it's uh, really a matter which uh, is um, up to the uh, corporations but we see um, that voluntary standards doesn't work so it's now up to the uh, European Parliament and up to the European government to make a first step. But in the long run, uh, we need uh, something like a, a global supply chain law, which is um, already um, negotiated, uh, which is already an uh, issue at the UN. Since uh, 2015, and there are also yearly uh, negotiations at the Human Rights Council in uh, Geneva. And there are these uh, negotiations about this UN binding uh, treaty for business and uh, human rights. And this uh, could really be an opportunity uh, to make a difference in the long term. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosenberger, for this assessment. Um, I think you have shown us that it is a problem that has been existing for a very long time and has not yet been sufficiently addressed. So we can really only hope and work towards towards making um, towards making higher standards within supply chains happen in the future. Um, a quick look on the clock tells me that we have now reached the end of our panel for today. And I would like to take this opportunity to once again um, wholeheartedly thank Ms. Rosenberger and Professor Fika for joining us here today in our panel and for sharing the, the knowledge and their enthusiasm on the topic with us. And I am sure the topic of food supply chain resilience will remain a very important and pressing one in the future, just as it is now. And in my opinion, it is a topic that is always worth to keep an eye on. Um, now, before we end this panel, I would like to note that what follows now is a half hour break at today's StasiCon. And afterwards, the final two breakout sessions of this day will take place starting at 3.45 p.m. Um, those session, sessions will be held parallel and one of them will handle the economics of food, while the other panel aims um, to answer the question whether there is a human right for food. So once again, two very interesting topics. Um, thank you very much for your participation, also to the audience. And as I just saw in the chat, um, I would like to, to draw your attention to that. Christian, um, Professor Fika has been so kind to share his email address in the chat in case anyone is interested in contacting him in the future. With these words, I once again thank your speakers very much. And I wish the audience and our speakers a wonderful afternoon and a very interesting Dasikon. Thank you very much and goodbye.